So uh, I'm really excited that we have the two gentlemen here on, uh, on stage that will introduce themselves shortly. Um, so the reason for this talk really is that you know, economists have a hard time describing uh, the reality and, um, <laughs> and certainly of today's complex systems. But still, you know, theories have a disciplining factor, right? Uh, on our thought, it will stop in a second. So theories have a disciplining factor on our thoughts, so, so they're quite informative in how we can structure the world. Um, and technology investors, you know, are inherently risk takers. So they, you know, they, they come up with a vision uh, based on limited amount of information and think about how the world looks like in two, five, 10, 15 years. And uh, you know, they place bets accordingly. So which most of you, it's what you do, you, you place bets. Uh, and then you have some people like us that help you. So um, I'm really happy that, uh, that, that we can have these two gentlemen here. So we will, uh, we have Jason Potts here from uh, RMIT and uh, Matt Law from uh, Outlier Ranchers. We have three topics that we will discuss. One is the you know, theoretical underpinnings, uh, basically, of what, what is going on and, uh, and how we can think about these decentralized systems. And uh, the second part, we'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, the, the reality, what, what will hit us and, uh, and how we're going to make our lives in the future. And lastly, we're going to think about a little bit when the world looks different and is decentralized, who's going to be in charge. <laughs> so those, uh, those are the three topics and uh, you know, why, why don't you start introducing yourself, Matt? Hello. Ah, there I am. Nice to meet you all. My name is Matt Law. I'm, I'm from Outlier Ventures. I'm a partner at Outlier, Outlier Ventures in London. We, uh, we're based in London and Toronto and Chicago, North America, and I'm partly remote with some other people. And we're um, an early stage venture investor into decentralized technology projects, uh, teams who are interested in uh, a particular area in the space that we like to focus on. So there's a lot of interest in financial innovation, a lot of interest in Bitcoin, and, and, and that's you know, definitely a real fundamental uh, advance and change in how uh, commerce and the economy is going to work. We have a, 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 a thesis we call the convergence thesis, which is really the, that fundamental innovation in how, how um, the, the world works is, gonna, is, is basically one about data. And that data um, is going gonna, is gonna to be from IoT, uh, being sensor, sensor data being incorporated and then being processed and transported via blockchains and then assessed and, and, and managed via intelligence. Um, my journey to the space actually, um, I used to work in digital innovation uh, and uh, welcome to the talk. Hi, come in. <laughs> uh, and uh, I saw the first two rounds of the uh, internet revolution uh, the, uh, the publishing, the, the, the dot-com boom in the year 1999 and 2000, and then I saw the, the read-write web, the social media revolution, a mobile revolution of sort of 2006 through 2015. And one of the things that I saw from that is uh, this um, incredible amount of tech utopianism that comes through from that, and I think we see some of that here at the moment as well. And, uh, and one of the things that... Um, that, that you know, we don't realize was going to happen when, we, when all that first round of the internet started is, is these platform monopolies, these data monopolies that have come. And I think what we see through, through our industry and through our movement is, um, is a reaction to that in many ways. And I think one of the things I think is interesting to think about and maybe to talk about a little bit here today is what do we not yet realize about the what's being set up at the moment and how do we deal with those externalities as they arise? Thank you. Jason? Yeah, um, thank you, Ralph, for inviting us in. It's good to, be, good to meet you all. Um, so I'm Jason Potts. I'm a professor of economics at RMIT University in, in Melbourne, and I'm an, I'm an economist. And my background has always been economics of new technology. And about four years ago, um, myself and my research team were studying a bunch of this early stage tech. And Bitcoin slash blockchain was one of about four that we were looking at. And what basically happened is we just got obsessed with it. We, we went down the rabbit hole. This is a common experience of many people in this space. But ours wasn't so much a sort of tech obsession with what this, what this new technology could do. We were looking at this as economists and realizing that this was a fundamental new 
we, we've entered, eventually sort of coined the phrase institutional technology, but a fundamental new way that economies will work. And that was an incredible thing for us because um, what we sort of quickly realized was that these sorts of technologies like blockchain as institutional technologies um, have come along before, right? But they're, they're not very common. Um, the joint stock company is an example of this. Um, synchronized time, when everyone can sort of use the same time to coordinate work schedules and clock and, and so on. Um, blockchain is one of these technologies and we sort of quickly realized that this will fundamentally change the way economies work. So we sort of set out to understand that. So um, three years ago, um, two years ago really, I think, Two years ago, the university funded what's called the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, which at the time was the world's first social science research institute on blockchain. Um, it's more or less a bunch of economists with some political scientists and legal theorists and, and sociologists thrown in. And as of a few months ago, we've um, expanded that considerably. But our perspective on this is that um, this is something that you know, this isn't just a sort of a new technology that is of, of interest to developers and computer scientists and, and, and from a sort of better, faster, cheaper perspective. This is a fundamental new um, institutional arrangement for the global economy. And we're just in the very, very, very early stages of that process. But already you can start to see the outlines of, of what will shift. And I think that's what we want to talk to as we go through. Exactly. Thank you, Jason. So that will lead us into the first question and just a small excursion here. So in 2015, when I was introduced to Ethereum, I Googled economics of blockchain and Jason's <laughs> article, one of Jason's articles, came up first. So um, I'm thankful that I found this article and subsequently we started talking about this topic. So since I haven't been in a microeconomics class for a while, Jason. Um, you stipulated that you know this this stack or this technology mm. is competing with you know institutions of capitalism. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit what you mean with that and, and what this means for firms and for markets and for principal agent and relationships? And maybe just briefly explain you know how economy how economists think that these institutions exist in the first place. Yeah. Or why. Yeah, so, so the, the core insight here is that um, what an economy is made of is, is, is some you know, technologies and recipes for converting you know, materials into other materials, you know, inputs into outputs. But an economy is also made of institutions which coordinate economic actions, right? And when we think of technological change, we usually think almost entirely in terms of you know, lasers and satellites and, and you know, nanoparticles and, and those sorts of inputs to outputs technologies. But just as important, arguably even more important, are technologies for coordinating activity. So this is trade, coordination of trade and contracting. This is coordination of a group of people come together and need to agree about how to do a thing and then monitor that behavior and so on. These are firms, right? Um, we then need background institutions, rules, legislation, regulations, so on, to govern all of that. And for you know, the last, you know, let's say a thousand years, we've had more or less one technology for doing that, which is um, the humans use language and writing to trust the other humans. Right? And um, we haven't had technological change or productivity growth in that. We've gotten sort of better or worse ones. We've got trusted or corrupt ones. Um, we've got smarter or less smart ones. We've got you know, business schools and so on to do that. We go through huge processes to try and select high quality people to sort of fit into those roles. But the one thing that we have never, ever been able to do is automation. Um, automation has happened everywhere except in institutional governance. And you know, we don't even think of that as a technology. Um, it's just, of course you need a firm, or of course you need a government or, um, to do these things. And this is the shift, right? This is the nature of the shift that we're happening, that, that is happening. And it's, it's like the shift between um, activity that takes place in a firm or activity that takes place in a market. And, and you've got you know, transactions, costs, and, and economic language determine where that occurs. What has just shifted in 2009, and this is the new economy that we're entering into, is a world where prior to 2009 and for the previous you know, thousands of years, all economic activity either took place in firms, in markets, or in governments, or in some combination of those three institutions for coordinating activity. 
Now there's four. Now there's blockchain. So this notion that some of the activity that takes place in firms will shift to blockchain. Some of the activity that takes place in government will shift to blockchain as an institution. And you know, it's not entirely clear exactly where all those shifts are going to take place. It's not the case that this sector will move and that one won't. Um, this will be an unbundling and a rebundling and a, and a, a re-coordination. Re but what we basically predict is that this massively powers up how markets work. We're going to see a lot more market activity because we can track property rights and, and, and payments and so on. The cost, the cost of using markets has fallen, um, which means that the relative cost of using hierarchies, firms and governments, has risen. Um, so what we'll, what, we'll affecting, what we'll expect to see is structural change in economies as activities are re-coordinated from um, you know, using firms governments and so on, as the coordinating mechanism for, for organization into using blockchain technologies. What that looks like is just automation of governance, automation of, 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 um, of coordination. Great. Thanks. So if you're, so, so if you're confused, uh, Matt will elaborate on you know, how we're going to make money on this. <laughs> yeah. So... Well, that's uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> So first he gave us your money, and then we're going to make you money. So that's how it's going to work. No, but so Matt, you know, your, your, your firm is basically investing on this, on this thesis that the world is decentralized, that this, that this technology stack or this blockchain technology will take over a lot of this coordination. Um, you know, your place, you're, you're talking of sovereignty of users uh, over their data and, and entire economies that will really be driven by data. So maybe you can um, you can explain a little bit about how you think of this what we generally refer to as Web three landscape and um, you know and your vision of this data economy. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I talked a little bit about our basic thesis about convergence a, f a few minutes ago, um, but I, I was really struck actually just now by one of the things that Jason said around automation because I think I think if you Think about what's been happening in the world in the broad stroke of things for the last 60, 70, 100 years. I think, I think what's actually happening is progressively our, our society, our economy is being automated. And that started off in the manufacture of goods and then it, it went to the way in which we store and manage information. And now that's reaching how our economy and, and, our, and our society is being organized. Um, and I think if you think about that, um, that concept of the fourth industrial revolution, which some of you would have heard about, I imagine. Um, what uh, we then sort of, I think, need to think about is, is what is actually required to make that work. If you think about all those things that you, you and I have as a vision for the future, smart cities, autonomous vehicles, you know, robotics, all of these things, um, that basically wouldn't work at the moment. Um, and, and I think the reason for that is because we have um, our, our, our basic computing model is one of there being a server which produces information and transmits it over the internet to clients, phones, computers, other devices. And uh, already uh, about half of all of the users of the internet are not actually people, they're machines. Um, uh, you know, little robots, on, software bots on the internet. Um, and as you imagine what it would take to just to take the... How much data would it take just to make the city of Zug uh, a smart city? And then you multiply that out by every, everything else. I think it becomes quite obvious that, that you need distributed systems for that to work. And, and then you think, well, how would, how would that distributed system actually, actually, actually take place? Well, you need some means of being able to, to um, manage transactions, to manage trust, basically, across a system that doesn't um, uh, have a, a central counterparty. Uh, or a central arbiter, or, the, or you need to do that more quickly than you could refer to the Google Cloud. And I think one of the things we need to think about is where we are at the moment, which is essentially these, you know, the internet being four or five big companies and take, taking increasingly large amounts of uh, value out of the space. Um, what, is, what are those, those things that are going to be the first things, if you like, from an investor's point of view, what are going to be those first things that, that start um, being... Um, uh, uh, radical transformations, and I think you see that in the evolution of how money is being handled, but I think we're also starting to see that in things like 
how identity is being managed, how, um, how we manage machine transactions, agent-based systems, uh, and then sort of more, I think, you know, things about the automation of contract execution, smart contracts, if you like, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that whole idea that you don't uh, need to have a manual process. Let's just think of it very, very broadly. You don't need a manual process for payments. You don't need a manual process for decision making. It can just be automated. And I think without getting into all the technical details, that's what we're really excited about, about decentralized and distributed systems. And, and that's why we're spending a lot of time and our life's work thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Matt. So now we, we were like on a fairly high abstraction layer, so I'd like to get back to, you know, the discussion we had before and relay that. So, uh, Jason, you wrote an article, or you published an article, you probably wrote it a while ago, but uh, <laughs> you published an article recently that describes the cost of trust mm. in certain economies. And assuming that we are, we are right with our hypothesis here, um, we can eliminate roughly, what, 35% of, you know, productive workforce yeah. in the United States. So, um, that produces largely trust, right, that fairly high transaction cost. So, if you, you laid out, you know, maybe some more visions about markets, so, you know, what, what does this really mean uh, in terms of, um, in terms of opportunities for, for economies? Yeah. Yeah, so trust is a really important thing to understand here because trust is what's being automated here. And there's often some confusion that sort of began when we describe, say, um, consensus mechanism Bitcoin as a trustless technology, as if trust is free. And that's absolutely not true. Um, rather, what, what this technology has revealed is just how much we have been paying for trust. And this was what the, what, what the exercise we, we did to try and estimate what the cost of trust in, a, in an economy or society is. And it's one of these things, it's like that we, we just don't even, economists don't even bother to measure because well, why would you, well, what's the alternative? So what we went through is, and we used US occupational data, We've, um, we plan to replicate this on other, on other data sets, but it was a, we went through every single job classification in the US and then estimated what fraction of each job was devoted to just trust work, which means um, imagine a world where I can, where all statements are true and everyone is trustworthy. What stuff do you not need to do? Right. Mm -hmm. um, for a start, you don't need to write contracts. Um, you don't need to do auditing. You don't need to do managing because you can just tell people to do the thing and they'll just do it. Um, so it just turns out that a whole lot of, you know, and if you don't need any of that, you don't need you know, legal, large parts of the legal profession, you don't need to organize that. You know, it turns out huge amounts of the economy exist just simply because it's not the case that we're all untrustworthy. It's just, it's expensive. We have to do it. This is what a high, high functioning, well-run economy looks like. Um, is actually we put a lot of effort into um, producing trust, right? So trust is handmade. Lots of lots of the economy are machine made, but trust is handmade. We we make it by trust. By, um, so what our estimate was was this number that even surprised us when we calculated it. It was around sort of thirty three percent, or thirty five percent, I think it was. But the point is not the exact number. It's the order of magnitude. That's a third of all of everything we do is not actually productive. It's just what needs to be done in order to enable an economy to function. Right? So will all of that go away? Probably not. Um, but that's what we're going to automate. Right? That's the space we're moving into. And once you've automated trust, um, it's not just that, okay, and then that's done. It's that, okay, we just automated it. I wonder what we can build on top of that then. So this becomes a sort of platform institutional layer um, that this is the disruption that we see. Right? It's, it's not that, that this technology brings is automation of trust, which provides a platform layer for different firms, different people in different parts of the world to come together to coordinate at low cost, at much lower cost. If they can do that, they can do more economic activity. And this was the sort of key insight for us that Blockchain technology, by reducing the cost of trust, by automating trust, has the same impact on an economy, say, as reducing trade barriers or as increasing the quality of administration or increasing the quality of management. It improves the efficiency by which economic activity takes place, which means you get more of it. That's, 
That's where the new wealth is coming from, from this technology. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm really glad that we can live with, with a few less lawyers. We really do. <laughs> uh, the, the problem is then the, and the accountants. Uh, uh, but then the question is, you know, what are these people going to do, man? So, how, <laughs> so it's going to be enough just to produce data <laughs> and own it. And, uh, you know, I give it to a few machines and, and the economic rent from that is going to pay for my retirement. Well, for sure, I think uh, uh, one of the things that you, you or I may not realize is that um, the, the value of our data is probably, you know, Facebook makes $73 per person per year. That's globally, so high net worth individuals such as yourself, I imagine, is... Uh, it's probably a little more than that. Um, but as obviously, that's not enough for a person to live on. <laughs> um, um, but one thing that I, I would say is that, of course, you know, big technological changes, and I do believe we, you know, whether or not you buy the blockchain thesis, we are, we li we are living through one, um, it does create sort of disruption in the way that people live their lives. Um, and at a personal level, I think, you know, you, you need to... Well, either engage in some kind of caring or non-automatable profession, <laughs> or to or to figure out how you can um, you can uh, harness these changes that are happening. And I think one of the you know there are no unemployed uh, uh, hand loom manufacturers uh, or workers today, uh, and the reason is because you know while that's that that industry was automated 250 years ago, you know the the, the we were able to use that to. Um, to, to do as yet unknown forms of economic activity. And I think what this, this innovation that Jason's been talking about uh, will enable is for um, more economic activity, different types of economic activity that don't exist today to take place. I'll give you a couple of examples of that and things that we're interested in at the moment, um, which are in, enabled or empowered by distributed systems. One of which is, um, well, both of them actually are sort of based on this idea that there's a changing relationship between the firm, companies, and, and the market. Um, and, and one area is, is in sort of agent-based systems, which is essentially um, that, that any person, company, or thing could have a representative piece of software that, uh, that uh, transacts on its behalf. So rather than, uh, I used to go to a travel agent, I now go to the internet. <laughs> if, if I want to go on an international journey, I, I brief my, my software agent, which then organizes that for me. Well, that's a personal example. Think about that from a logistics or a supply chain point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think agent-based systems is, is one area that I think is really, really interesting. And the other one um, is, is in the whole area of smart contracts, which you know essentially is, at the moment, you think about that about, well, I, I code something in, in Ethereum, and you know I pay some gas, and something happens. But think about you know, all of those lawyers and all of those accountants all the jobs that they're doing essentially are if this, then that statements, which you can automate in code. Yeah, can I just, um, just follow up on that? I think that's absolutely right about where this is going. And we're very excited about what this is going to do for agent bots. And, and we've, we've um, been doing quite a bit of work in that space. But the other thing is, it's, just, it's, it's not the case that you know, suddenly we don't need accountants or lawyers <laughs> um, in the same way that, you know, the, um, you know or, or engineers for that matter. It's, what shifts is the parts of the job that can be automated will be automated. And what happens then is that everyone else is doing far more design work. So you end up with um, kind of accountancy really becoming a design, a creative design profession mm. rather than a um, bookkeeping auditing profession. Um, same thing with the smart contract lawyering becoming a, um, you know, a crafting design profession rather than a, um, a sort of, of, essentially, it doesn't take a profession and get rid of it. It takes a profession and fractures it into its parts. And interesting, what it leaves behind are the fun parts, the, 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 you know, the good parts of the work, and automates the, the bits that are not. So, I mean, I, I think this could quite possibly be the best thing that's ever happened to the legal profession and the accounting profession, because the other sort of thing to think about is at the moment the accounting profession and legal profession mostly do work for humans. But the big thing that we're going to need, that's going to need tracking and auditing and contract writing for is machines. So, but in order for us to do that, we need to dramatically lower the cost of delivering that service. So we'll keep track of a lot more stuff. We'll contract a lot more things. We'll have property rights over a vastly increased amount of objects. And that's, these are where the new professions or the existing professions will evolve into. 
um, at the moment, they're relatively small and, and elite in that sense. So again, the watchword here is sort of structural transformation, not, not just whole things disappearing and, and growing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So we're going to spend just briefly on governance, and then we'll take some questions, because we are uh, on a uh, firm time schedule. So, so then in the future, we transact on this data, right? we exchange uh, digital assets, um, which represent virtual assets or real assets. We have some crypto punks over there, right? Uh, it's kind of one in, uh, two in one. Um, by way of coins, tokens, um, that I can issue, anyone can issue, P2P, uh, most likely anonymously. Um, so, how are we gonna govern this? Hmm. Who's in charge? The machine? <laughs> no. Um, so this is the hard question. This is the relevant question I think everyone's wrestling with right now. And I think that the point of it is we've got to realize that we're asking this question from a perspective of a previous set of technologies. So we were asking this from the perspective of nation states and, 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 um, and, and other sort of mechanisms like that. I think the, well, there's two aspects to this. One is where the governance goes. And at the moment, where our governance goes is we write it in legislative books, we, we embody it in people. It's a, you know, it's just a handmade governance that, that's crafted, and then we build nation states around it and firms and so on. Um, where we're going with this is platforms, is that the governance gets hard-coded into the platforms itself. Um, we've, you know, we've, we've seen this already. I mean, the, the word for that is a protocol, right? Um, and we, we, we put more and more governance into protocols. And then there's the question of how do we change protocols? And that, that gets us into this question of you know, the role of voting and forking and updating and so on. But the, the broad sort of notion here is if we can do that, the, 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 the thing that this then creates the possibility of is which platform? Right? We can have multiple platforms. You don't have to have, if you're in this geographical space, you have to use that single platform. Um, we can decouple this relationship between physical space in the world and the governance platform upon which things are trading and running. And so where I think this goes is competitive platform governance. And some of this will come from existing large tech companies and so on, stitching these together, or consortia, things like the, the, the Facebook thing that we've seen in the past week coming into that space. But there's no real limit to that notion of competitive platform governance. And the reason that I'm sort of optimistic about this scenario of, of multiple platforms coming into the world is that strong ones should drive out weak ones in the sense that you always want to choose the strongest governance to locate your economy, your trading on. Right. So you'll, you'll always pick something good and strong. It's the same reason that companies choose to locate in Switzerland and not you know, random other country somewhere else, right? Because this is where governance and institutions are strongest. You always choose strong. And I think that same dynamic will play out in competitive platform governance and a blockchain economy, that we can expect to see competition at the margin of embedding high quality institutional governance into platforms um, and you know, essentially, that's a market competitive process, but for government. Great. I, I thought that was brilliant. Um, the, I think this is one of the most fascinating areas that, that uh, we're, we're working in at the moment. And, and, and when you think about the technologies that we're sponsoring or the teams that we're sponsoring, a lot of the, what you talk about is sort of what on-chain governance do you have, what off-chain governance do you have, and there are some really interesting experiments or, or, or you know projects going on about you know decentralized autonomous organizations DAOs and what Tezos is doing here and Aragon and, and, and many others but I think a lot of that thinking is actually is, is actually a little bit naive because what um, if you think about where we have come from as a, as a culture as a society you know the last big um, evolution in, in, in that kind of organizational structure came during the Enlightenment with things like the republicanism movement and um, the American Constitution and all those sorts of things. And, and that idea that, you know, you need an executive branch, you need a legislative branch, you need a judi judi judiciary, <laughs> a means of resolving disputes, and, and, and how all of those things work together and as a means of, of sort of um, 
uh, uh, creating something, I think, is, is really, really interesting. Thanks, good. So we, we will take uh, some time to, uh, to take uh, questions. So the question is on uh, the economics of uh, Libra, as you can work. Yes. So we take it seriously. Yeah, um, I'm taking it very seriously. I think this is the beginning of something we're going to see a lot more of. Um, this was foreshadowed by um, an economist called Frederick von Hayek, wrote about this a long time ago in the context of private money. Um, what we saw for the first time with Libra was an effective consortia to produce a, a, a private digital money. It's not a cryptocurrency, a private digital money. Um, and most of those, you know, the, the world has tried those before, but this is the first one that is actually a credible threat um, in the sense that I think what has changed and why this couldn't have even happened 10 years ago was that big tech was just not big enough 10 years ago. This is now a credible thing where you've got you know, Facebook and, and, and the various consortia that pulled together. If you look at the number of users they've got, um, you know, that's bigger than every nation I can think of. Um, it's... I think it's it's finally a credible, I mean, a, a credible sort of threat now, in, in terms of um, providing this this tech. But to me, the most interesting thing is governance, right? Um, in the sense that what they're offering there is not just a digital money; it's a platform that has payments tech and governance tech and trust tech and identity tech all baked into it. And that traditionally, all of those are services normally provided by government. So. Now, I'm not sure you know, what will actually happen here, but I think this is the beginning of a new world order. Um, I think the Facebook and Libra consortia is the first of many that we will subsequently see. Um, it's interesting to study for that reason, to, to look into this. You know, and I, I, I wish them well with this, um, but it's, I don't see this as Libra Facebook competing with Bitcoin. I see Libra Facebook competing with banks. Yeah. And, that's the interesting part. I just had a couple of comments. First thing, when I uh, when I first heard about it, I can't tell you how pleased I was. I was I, I, because I just thought I did not go crazy a few years ago, and, <laughs> and there is this kind of you know the, the world is now coming around to this. I think you know there are you know there's a question about whether you want corporations to be more powerful than than countries, uh, and and whether you know there's an alternative model which is should or could be more, more powerful than corporations and countries. Um, and that's a sort of a fundamental question about, about, about society. Um, but I, I, I do also think that there are many positives that could come from it, but I just think it's probably not the case that we all need to sacrifice that much privacy to get those benefits. The question was about trust and you know, what to choose, basically the certainty of a trustworthy system, right? When, when are we there? Uh, Jason, you do some work on uh, healthcare, right? You have some. some yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start by just stepping back a bit. I mean, this is a very, very early stage experimental technology. And I think the, the, the way forward for this and how we answer the questions that you raise is we just try lots of stuff and we see what fails and we do it as quickly as possible and crucially as painlessly as possible, which goes to the second point. Um, we were talking before about um, where the major blockchain just breakthrough use cases really are. Um, my bet on this is agriculture, um, and particularly agricultural supply chains. And the reason for that is, is um, it's the safest place to experiment completely, um, rather than health or rather than pharmaceuticals or other sort of more, or other more difficult, more challenging problems. Um, and you know, it's a huge global um, industry, it, it touches everything, it goes everywhere. Um, so you know, how we do this, how we get to that point of trying to figure out what, what protocols to use, what, willing, what level of privacy and so on are we willing to tolerate is we just start in the safest space we can um, and, and, and then experiment there and work on it. As with all other technologies that we've, we've gone through, this has always been the case. They, they're messy, they're experimental early on. The crucial thing is we just want to move as quickly as possible through that phase. And um, I think you know, so. I, I, I think health will be a major, dramatic shift in, in this, in terms of um, what this can do for the global economy, in the sense of it's one of the most expensive parts of, of an economy. But we don't start there. That would be crazy. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, Patrick. Uh, 
you've been talking about the new world order or about society and corporation, what's gonna be better if the society or kind of the country is bigger than the corporation and so on. But if I'm looking to that new world order, right? Roughly 1% of world population maximum understands the potential change happening now, right? Um, I would say even less than 1%. Um, how do you see kind of the masses um, shifting into that new world order, and how long is this going to take us until um, the masses really understands that and will adopt kind of to that new world order? Do you want to go? I mean, Matt invests all that, so <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, I think there is a, I think there's a little bit of a fallacy that we live in this, this, this world of exponential growth and things getting faster and faster all the time. And if you look at other technology cycles, you know, you know they, they were inventing the internet in the 60s and, and then they were doing some stuff on email in the 70s and then, they, you know, and then people started getting modems in the 80s. And so, so I don't think it's necessarily the case that you know, we have a big speculative mania a year and a half ago and then in a year and a half's time everyone's using this stuff. I think what's, uh, uh, what's maybe a little bit... Um, uh, been, has been the thought, or is a thought in a lot of these kind of revolutions, which I do believe we are in, is that you build this parallel, separate, you know, amazing world, and then everyone sort of shifts over into it. I think actually what's much more likely to happen is what we see through the work that a lot of the people here are doing and a lot of the people in the rest of the, rest of the space are doing is a, a, a few things that, that, make, that, that point the way to something interesting that gets then progressively integrated into the economy. And to your point about... Um, to what, to what extent and when will people understand blockchain. I sort of actually don't think that that's that much of a problem. Like when, last time you sent an email, did you go, I really hope the TCP IP works properly on this and, and the SMTP protocol, I hope it's working. No, no one does that, right? So for most people, stuff just works. And that is, is good. And that's where we want to get to, where no one even knows what it is and it's not important. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, we're, we're off because you know we have some opportunity for you to invest uh, in uh, you know, get some exciting companies afterwards. So thanks a lot for coming. Uh, I'm really happy. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, what's happening in the next uh, hour and a half.